just set all my keys there. Oh, okay. You can put them in my back pocket. I'll set it over here. Thank you. scarves and hats 
for Bethlehem House of Red, and it's fully decorated. I, I told uh, Peggy yesterday, like, we may have to pull some off just so there's room for people to put more on. Uh, otherwise, it may fall over. I don't know how sturdy that base is. <laughs> Uh, but, but you guys respond just passionately around tangible acts of love. Like, let us do something. Let us not just say, oh, we wish you well, pat you on the back, and, and off you go. There's this genuine care and follow through for people, even people we don't know. Uh, and this goes into the, you know, the family that as a church we're adopting. And if, if you need one of these inserts, they're not in your bulletin. They're uh, on the back, they're in the bulletin last week, but it has the ages of the families uh, that we're adopting, the things that they're looking for. Uh, and, and it's just impressive how you guys continue when there's a need to just rally around people, right? So, so the identity, what makes West Portland unique? Why should somebody stop here? Um, as opposed to continuing 10 minutes further down the road, is you guys love each other well, and you guys are passionate about tangible acts of love. And so uh, when we come back after Christmas, I think we're going to lean into a little bit of playing that out. What does that look like in our identity? How does that form even programs or how we do service, making sure that we lean into who we are and be who we are well. Um, other announcements is uh, if you did order a Christmas wreath, uh, Boy Scouts were setting up out there, so make sure you get your Christmas wreath on the way out. If you didn't order one, uh, they will have a few extra from what I was told, so you're not out and you can still get one. Uh, the other thing, Scout related right after, uh, there's a special charge conference tomorrow uh, on Zoom, and it'll be broke out, but there's, this gets into the fun part of church business and all of that. Boy Scouts. Uh, have fire, filed bankruptcy around uh, charges and allegations and all of that. And the way it carries over, because United Methodist Churches have been chartered sponsors, some of that responsibility um, and potential lawsuits carrying over. And so there's a whole bunch of legal, formal hoopla that we have to do. So tomorrow there will be a Zoom conference, special charge, and the churches that are involved will be voting um, kind of how to respond to that. So, I believe those are all of the announcements. No, I almost missed the important one. one. All right. My blood drive. <laughs> yes. Blood drive not on the... the blood drive is not in the bulletin. It is posted and it's on the website as well. Um, the date is, remind me, 23rd? It's the Wednesday, Christmas Eve Eve. How do you like that? Huh? <laughs> Yeah, so that'd be the 23rd, right? Yeah. All right, 25 minus 1 minus, yeah, 23rd. Uh, so 23rd, blood drive here uh, with the Red Cross. I know there's are a few sign-ups already, but there are still space um, for that. Uh, the other thing in your bulletin, what is there, is we're going to make our December 19th service uh, our Christmas carol service. So you'll hear from me less and we'll actually sing good old-fashioned Christmas carols more. Uh, but this is a great opportunity to be intentional, to invite friends. Uh, so Barna Group, they do statistics nationally, and they do polls and all of this, and scientific method. And, and they, years ago, they did one of 67% of people said they would go to church if they were invited by somebody they knew. So sometimes we rely on the church, like let's let the church do the advertising, make sure it's in the bulletin, you know, do a, a Facebook social media announcement. Uh, only like 10% of people will respond to that. But 67% of people will respond to being invited by somebody they know. So with that, we made these uh, pretty decent uh, little photo cards, take one. If you need more, they're in the back. But I would love it if every single person actually took one of these and put it in somebody else's hands and say, hey, you want to join us for a Christmas carol service? Now, here's the other idea. I floated this a little bit. A lot of you guys have been stuck inside for a while. Um, and we were just talking about this where, like, we actually got used to doing church in pajamas, right? But over the last year, two years, we haven't really had an excuse to dress up. So my other thought is, like, let's actually, for this 19th service, like, 
let's just make an excuse to dress up. You know, I, I, I'm not going to wear a tie, I don't do ties, but I may, I may, I'll even put on a coat if you all dress up. Uh, make pants instead of jeans, like some actual slacks, right? We can, we just an excuse, dress up, come together, sing songs together, and have um, a fun time as we go in. That's the Sunday right before uh, the week of Christmas. So Christmas Eve's carol service, put this in someone's hand. Invite them to come. Gifts and offerings as well with the, the church. We uh, will have the basket in the back, which is up there right now, but they'll grab that. Uh, can give online, send in checks. We aren't passing the offering um, yet again, but we need to continue to make sure that everything's functional in the church and the lights are on so that we can continue to care for one another and we can continue to get passionate about those acts of kindness and love. Would you guys at this time stand with me for our call to worship? In this season of expectation, into the bustle of our lives and the hard to find moments of solitude. Into our homes and situation, along with friends and families. We prepare to love Christ Jesus Into our hearts and those often hidden parts of our lives. We prepare to love Christ Jesus In the season of anticipation. We prepare to love Christ Jesus Man. For the candle lighting today, we're adding last week was the week of hope and we're adding the week of peace the candle of peace this week uh, we're going to sing a song uh, just verse 2 which talks about the lighting of the peace candle uh, we'll do the verse once, uh, light the candle and then we'll sing it again and then we'll do our scripture reading for the day Scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. It's around the birth of Christ, and it says, While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn, firstborn son, and wrapped him in the hands, bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Father God, I pray this morning that uh, as we come together in service and we look at scripture, we sing songs, we encourage one another, I pray that you would meet us. And as the candle of peace burns today, I pray that you would work in our hearts and give us peace that can only come from you. We ask this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated, and we're going to watch a short video before you, I'm getting a no. Oh, it was in there. Okay, we aren't going to watch a video. We'll get that to you at another point in life. Um, let's go ahead and just jump right into joy. 
And it's the idea of Advent conspiracy. Let's, let's conspire to find this meaning again. And they focus on four things. Uh, and their weeks are to worship fully. And they define that as Christmas begins and ends with Jesus. To spend less, literally to free up your resources to support things that truly matter. To give more, uh, which sounds counterintuitive, right? We're going to spend less, but we're going to give more. But the giving more is, is to be intentional and relational. And then to love all, radically love others like Jesus did. And if we can, we can make that space where we begin to add that meaning again, let's worship fully, let's spend less on all the frivolous things, so we can give more to the things that truly matter, and then to love all in, in a radical way as Jesus did, then we can bring back a little bit of that meaning. When we sing joy to the world, we, we can actually not just have words we're singing, but, but there, there'd be some joy actually involved in it because we know we've been able to do these things. And so, so the challenge as we think about this piece is how do we, how do you, I mean, we as a church can figure it out, but you live in your home and in your world and with your family and with your friends. How do you, in this time, actually find a way to worship fully? To maybe spend less so you can give more, so you can love all. Uh, one of the things we always kind of do is we tell people, like, don't, don't buy us silly gifts. Uh, like... Put money around and experiences. My daughter, who lives in Connecticut, sent us a text and she wanted to know, like, what do, what do we want? She's like, I want to get you guys little gifts and, like, send it to you. One, my house is, is full. We have a little small town house. We don't actually need more things in the house. I'm like, take whatever you would spend, put it into a travel fund so that way we can, like, see each other more, right? Like, that's, like, meaningful stuff, right? So, how do we, how do we just, maybe with a filter, set aside some of the, the commercialism in order to find that piece. Uh, one of the things I also love uh, to do is this idea of the scripture passage that we looked at is that there's no room in the inn. And if you go into a little bit of cultural anthropology, right? So this is like the study of society and, and social structures, but specifically within cultures and time and space. And, and I tend to like to do that because we have you know, it's 2021, and when we think of an inn, you know, maybe, I don't know what you think of, like, some of you might be thinking Motel 6, and, and some of you guys might, you know, the lake resort at Coeur d'Alene, like, there may be a discrepancy there on what you think of an inn is, but uh, that, that word, when we look at all of it, and go ahead and put up the first slide of, a, of the house, if you would, uh, in, in that time, so a few things are going on in this scripture. First, let, let's go with this. Uh, and think through, right? There's no room in the inn. Better translated guest room, actually. Uh, and in that time frame, you know, just to set the story. So Mary becomes pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And she's like, okay, that's cool. We talked about a little bit of fear last week, interpretation. An angel comes to Joseph and tells Joseph, hey, don't be, you know, but take her as your wife, all of that. At the same time, they decide to take a census in the world. So everybody has to go back to their home city or city of origin, right? So while Mary is pregnant, Joseph and Mary have to travel to Bethlehem. Um, but everyone's going to Bethlehem, right? Because, I mean, everyone's going to their city. So, so cities are, are, are kind of overgrown with people returning. And... One of the pieces that sometimes in our mind, hindsight's a little 2020, right? So we kind of picture, and through the stories and the activity that, like you, you kind of get the image of Joseph going like door to door, right? Knocking, oh, hey, is there any room? Oh, no, going to the next door. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, is there any room? No, sorry, there's no room for you. Uh, but it's probably not what actually happened. When they did the census, uh, oftentimes people would stay out on the hillside almost like a caravan. You would be going in big groups to return to your family, and you would stay, you know, out along the hillside. You'd pitch a tent, or you'd stay off, you know, a little off the wagon, whatever. Um, 
inns as we understand them, or even some of the movies where you think of this, you know, maybe older uh, fantasy piece where they ride into the inn and they have all these rooms. That wasn't even really part of it. An inn, typically in that, that time frame, would be more of a, a central open room, and in the corner there would be a cook fire and tables, but then they would just move all of those tables, and you would throw down a straw mat, and you would sleep in this common room floor. Like, that was the Traveler's Inn. Now, could you imagine, for those of you who've given birth, that you would want to actually even give birth in a public inn, right? When so many people are, are, are there, right? You think, you, you know, you have your private suite, you have your birthing coach, you have, you know, all of these things, and no, no, we just, uh, let's move the dining room table over, and, uh, you know, all of you are here too, and you guys just right over here, you can go and give birth. Uh, the other part here in Luke 2 to draw note of is uh, it says that they were already in Bethlehem, right? So they were in Bethlehem, and then when the time came for her to give birth, they went and looked for a place to stay. So odds are, I mean, this is where we start to you know, dig through the story a little bit, uh, Mary and Joseph were already in Bethlehem, probably staying out in the caravan. And then, oh, contractions, water break. Like, I don't want to give birth on a hillside. Uh, let's head into the town a little bit more. Probably not wanting to give birth in the public inn at that time. So they begin to look for what's better translated instead of inn is guest house or guest room. And which should be doable because after all, Joseph's from Bethlehem. Odds are, he has cousins. This is his, his home family town. So he should have aunts, uncles, cousins, great cousins, or grandparents. What, there, there's, there should be some familiar ties to be able to find space. But there's no room in the guest house or the guest room. So they end up in the inn. So in this picture here, you can kind of get a little idea that so homes in that time, animals and livestock, like the other part of us in America and whatnot, we think we have our home, and animals are smelly, so we build a barn that is separate from the house, right? Uh, and like, man, who would put Jesus out in the barn, right? I mean, and, and if we knew, if Mary and Joseph knocked on my door and I knew it was going to be baby Jesus who would become, you know, God and man, like, I would give up my own room, right? But they didn't really know at the time. Uh, but, but animals in that culture, animals, uh, livestock, had equated to a lot of the family wealth. Like you were, your wealth depended on, yeah, I mean, money and gold, but a lot of had it come, like, oh, well, my family has five sheep and your family only has two sheep, right? They're, they're like, livestock was equated to family wealth. And people would steal livestock, and people, and there was also predators that would come out, wolves and whatnot, you know, you, Daniel, right, as a boy, fought off bears and lions, whatnot, protecting sheep, right? So you would you'd want to protect your livestock. So typically, the livestock of most family actually stayed in the home with the family. Uh, and in one-story homes, so depending on wealth, one-story homes in Bethlehem would usually, almost like this, where there would be this lower section, and the animals would stay there, and then it was just towards the back of the house, it was just raised up a little bit. That way, you know, all that animal stuff kind of, like, there's a little fit for them. Uh, and, and then there would be an eating area, and then at the back of that would usually be the family's bedroom. If they were a little bit wealthier, and they actually had a second story to it, up above is where the guest room would be, which is this verse that we talk about. There's no room in the inn. The actual word there in the text is kethaluma, which means guest room. There's only one other place in Scripture that it's used, and that spot Scripture is during the Passover, where Jesus sends Peter and John ahead of them, going into it and saying, hey, go and find someone, ask them where we can prepare the Passover. And he'll follow him, he'll be carrying a jar, that's the person you're supposed to follow, ask him where it is, the master's looking for a room, and he'll give you an upper room that's already prepared for the Passover. 
This became the Last Supper. So this, this, this word, guest room, cataluma, only used in scripture twice. Once in this process in the coming and the birthing of Jesus. Two at the Last Supper as he prepares his final days of death and crucifixion. And it's this guest room. So the animals, again, we're trying to keep them safe. So sometime in Bethlehem, they, like, it was usually a gated area. It was private. It was usually kept either warm, dry, cool in the summer, because the livestock, again, was the, the livelihood of the family. So with the guest room full, no room in the inn, but no room in the guest room, the, the area set aside for the animals was the safest place that Jesus could be born. It was a private place. So he wasn't in the inn or along the hillside. So a lot of times you're like, oh, those people, I can't believe they put him in the manger. I would never put Jesus in the manger. How dare they, right? We can, we can kind of make up this story towards whoever, you know. Sorry, but you got to go out to the, to the stall. The other uh, kind of story that gets around around Jesus is that, well, Jesus was actually probably born in a cave. And that could actually be because in Bethlehem, a lot of the homes were built up against a hillside. And either natural caves or they would dig out a space at the back of the home. And that's where they would keep the animals because the cave or the grotto would be cooler in the summer. It would be warmer in the winter. It was at the back of the home so predators couldn't get to it, um, whether human or, or animals. Uh, and so it becomes the safest place and the most secure place probably a dry place. And that's what was given to Mary and Joseph for the birthing of Jesus. And the question comes in, you know, how do we find room for Jesus? Well, they did the best they could back then. How do we find room for Jesus today? In our lives? Do we make space in our hearts, in our minds, in our budgets, uh, in our calendar, and physically even in our home? Do we create space for Jesus to live? Do we do, and maybe it's not perfect, maybe your house is a little overcrowded right now, but do you do the best you can to be intentional about creating a room for a little baby to be able to lay his head in a manger. Uh, Ephesians 3, 16 and 17 says, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. And Paul writing to the church of Ephesians is praying that this peace of God, this room, that there would be room and that room like actually dwells inside of you, not just externally. Oh, I went to church for Christmas. Lit the candle for Christmas. But internally, is there room for Christ in you? There's another spot in Revelations 3.20. And it says that you know, Jesus standing at the door and knock. It says anybody who's willing to get up and come to him and open the door and let him in, then he will come in and join you there and eat with you. Actually, to do life, communion, breaking of bread, all of that. One of the interesting things, though, is, is this image, and I've always loved this, and, and through pointing like, God is not such, even though he's all-powerful, all-knowing, we, we view this of him, this is, this is God, creator of the universe, coming into flesh, sacrificing his life, and they're like, this is, but he doesn't barge his way in, right? Yes, God wants a place in your heart and in your life, but he's not going to kick in your door and force his way in. Or take control and dominion away from you and turn you into a mindless imp because he wants followers. There has to be this invitation of this response. 
right? The, Jesus is at the door knocking, and, and you actually have to get up and go and open the door and invite him in. Mary and Joseph, looking for a place to, to, to give birth to Jesus, didn't barge their way in like, hey, uh, an angel told me that I got the Messiah on board. Uh, I need you to give up your house. Right? There's not this barging in or this dominance or this desire for control, but it's an invitation to you as an individual to come into something with more meaning. Come into an understanding of God of hope and a God of peace and a God of joy. And do we do that? Do we make that space? There's a, a poem, short story, um, that was written in, in 1951 called My Heart, Christ Home. Some of you guys may have read this by a guy named Robert Boyd Munger. And he actually translated that verse that I, I read. It says that Christ may settle down and be at home in your hearts by faith. I'm going to read that again. That Christ may settle down and be at home in your hearts by faith. The poem basically is this, this ongoing story of uh, somebody inviting Jesus into his home. And uh, his home isn't necessarily tidy yet. Right? It's, it's full of things. And he comes into first... Uh, the den or the study, the library. And and Jesus begins to have a conversation with this individual who's invited him into his home about, like, what, what are you consuming? What are you thinking about? What are you reading? And kind of, uh, kind of, you know, tell the story. Jesus almost like meddling, like, oh. Right? So just actually picture Jesus walking into your home and, like, going over to your bookshelf and going, oh, Peggy, let's see what you've been reading. Interesting, right? How many would be a little bit nervous if Jesus walked into your home right now and started, like, going through your drawers, uh, looking at your... <laughs> yeah. All right, good. I'm not the only one. You guys are really uncomfortable over there. We should follow the conversations with probably. Uh, <laughs> uh, right? Yeah. And, and this idea of, like, surrendering that. And so, so this individual in the story uh, actually finally surrenders, like, okay, God, I'm going to give you dominion of my, my debt in my library. And, which is great. Okay, I have this whole house, and Jesus, you can live in the den. And eventually, Jesus like, so you have more rooms? You got more rooms in your house? Uh, let's go to the living room. Let's, let's, well, maybe, you know, and it just it goes through room by room until eventually there's this one last upstairs closet. And Jesus is talking, like, let's talk about what's in this door. Nah, Jesus, you don't need in there. It's just the closet. <laughs> like, there's just, it's kind of where I keep some of my, my more, my, my hidden, you know, uh, sins that I don't want people to know about or fears or insecurity. Like, and Jesus, I have surrendered the entirety of my house to you already. Just, just let me keep this closet. A few things I'm not ready to, to surrender or give up. Um, the poem eventually, you know, he gives that up too, but it's interesting because it's like, Jesus, I'm not, I'm not strong enough to actually sort through that closet. I can't do it. Like, I will let you in, I'll unlock the door for you, but you're going to have to do it. I don't have the strength. And Jesus goes, I know, just give me the keys. Just give me the keys and I'll do it for you. Right, that surrender to God in this season. What does it look for you to create space or to make a room? And maybe it's not a guest room. Maybe it's the little inner part of a courtyard that's fenced off and private. Some fresh hay, some fresh straw. Where do you start? And how do you allow this God of peace, which this whole season is supposed to be about, and maybe it's just taking a 10-minute walk and breathing. <sighs> maybe it's finding five minutes when their TV's not on or the radio's not on. Or kids aren't asking you for something to just kind of pray and meditate. What does it mean for Christ to come into this world? What does it mean for Christ to come into my world? It, it starts with little pieces, but the more you find peace, the more you can carve out little chunks of meaning, the more you become at peace. 
with God in your life. And that's our hope this Christmas, right? We want to celebrate, we want the joy, we want to bring this in, and what does it look like to come in, to bring in? The Revelation 3.20 verse says, Listen, I'm standing at the door, knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come to you and eat with you and you with me. Let's pray. Father God, I ask that you would help us to create space. Lord, this Christmas, I want to be mindful of you. As I see joy and laughter in kids, I want to know that you are the source of that joy. When I show up and stand next to family to just support them, I I want to know that you're the one who gives me strength to do it. But I pray that we would make space for you. Emmanuel, God with us in the flesh, in our hearts and in our spirit. Lord, help us to yield some of that space. Maybe we need to work on letting you in, and maybe we need to work on getting rid of some stuff so there's room for you to sit. (laughs) But Lord, I pray that you would dwell with us this season, that we would be mindful that Christmas starts and ends with you, Christ. That's this in your name. Let's sing glory, let there be peace on earth.
know there's been uh, a few things. I'm still getting used to glasses, too, so I have to like, yeah, I hope I see you better. It's weird. Uh, there's been things that go on, right, as we, we come to this part of like joy and adoring God, but, but life does still happen. And part of us as a church caring for one another is making sure that we are lifting each other up in prayer with our joys and concerns or prayer requests. Um, I know Will's family have been dealing with son recovering from surgery, and uh, and your wife is in. She's in. Uh, she's in Nevada right now. Uh, her sister is. Uh, she's getting ready to take her sister to the hospital in Reno. Um, she is going through some very difficult times there, and uh, um, and just would like to ask for prayers for her. Yeah, so continue to pray for the women family. Our other prayer requests, joys, or concerns. Lori, you had a migraine yesterday. How are you today? Good and great, thank you. Modern medicine. Modern medicine. Uh, I work with a lady. I'm not going to share her name because it's very unique thing, but um, she is going through her, I think, second or third round of cancer treatment, and um, she is deciding to leave employment, and I just think she's really struggling. So if we could just pray for all those people who are not having a great time right now during the Christmas season, and a lot of people are struggling, and I think they need a prayer. Yeah. I have a praise. It's not quite a joy, but I've been working with a therapist is forgiving someone who disrespected Eric with their hate during his life and after his death. And I know Will, I'm not, thank you Will, he asked me, how did somebody hate Eric? And I remember after the first incident, Eric taught me to my dad, who in addition to loving Eric without end, was also a mentor to him. And my dad said, jealousy, and jealousy is hate. And so I ask for prayers for me. I ask for prayers for this person. But I also pray that when we think jealous thoughts, that we know that it's evil, it is easy to do that. It's easy to go to jealous to evil. And so yeah. that's my prayer, and that's my prayers. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you are finding hope and forgiveness in it. Good. Other uh, joys or concerns you want to share and pray about as a congregation? I would just like to say that please, when you're talking, please remove your mask because it is very difficult to hear what you are saying when you have a severe, a severe hearing problem. Yeah, it, try to project. Not everyone's going to be comfortable taking off their mask, and I can't actually encourage you to do that because of the county ban. <laughs> um, a praise and thank you to those who decorated. Yes, Joy uh, led a team. She's very adamant in saying it is a team. It wasn't all her, but uh, it is her uh, gathering and caring and vision that kind of helped put these pieces together. So, um, and she fed me lunch, so that's always <laughs> a praise. Well, let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much that you are uh, just an amazing God that meets us. And even just listening to these joys and concerns and how different they are. And yet, you are a God who can show up in every situation. But I pray for Whitman family. Uh, so they deal with recovery and helping uh, a sister and, and travel uh, with other complications. Do we understand it? Uh, Lord, the, the process of just struggling and showing up, like to be present with people, um, is so huge and valuable. And so we, we just thank you for the work that's being done there. We pray that you would miraculously um, work in that. We pray for everyone. As Rachel shared, not everyone is having a good time as we come into this Christmas, and specifically for her co-worker battling cancer and, and leaving employment in order to, to take care of, of everything, and just medical, physical, family, 
the weird bills that come with it, the scheduling of appointments and, and all of the things. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would be a God of wonder in that situation and in that lady's life, that you would just give her uh, a peace that transcends understanding, that people would like, how can you still have joy in this? And, and, and you would just be a God that makes people so surprised as you work in our lives. Lord, thank you for this work of, of forgiveness that's taking place and um, to not allow bitterness to just take root and then occupy one of our rooms with this process of removing uh, bitterness to be able to make space for your joy. Lord, I pray that you would continue to work in that situation and mind and heart and for all of our hearts that we would just be mindful of when we let jealousy or anger or spite or bitterness uh, occupy space that would be better spent with your spirit and joy, hope, peace, love, all of that. But I thank you for this church as it just continues to show up to decorate with one another and break bread, to, to bring socks um, and all hats to deeply and genuinely care for one another, to, to rally around this family. But I pray for them as, as this mom with three sons and their own follow-up appointments and medical bills and lingering things and, and power bill and to just feel cared for by this little congregation that gets passionate about loving people well. We ask that you work all of these things through your miraculous power. Amen. Would you guys stand with me for the reading of our benediction? Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of this world. All things break and all things can be mended. Now the time is they say, but with intention. So go, love intention. Extravagant, unconditional, the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is in you. Amen. Amen. I just want to remind you again, you have these little invitation cards in your bulletin. Um, let us celebrate well on the 19th as it's a Christmas carol service. Let this be a time where we can come and bring the people we care about alongside of us as we sing and celebrate of baby Jesus. As you guys go this week, I do pray that the God of peace, oh, you can play in the background. I can talk loud enough. That uh, the God of peace and that the God of hope would reside in your hearts, even this day, as you encounter someone later this afternoon. Go in peace.